Let me start by thanking IPAM for giving us the opportunity to organize this great event. And I would like also to, to thank Christian, because without his constant um, nudging, <laughs> we wouldn't be able to make it as well as we did. And at the same time, the staff of uh, IPAM for the hospitality. So today I will present some results on efficient quantum algorithm for some classes of linear and nonlinear differential equations. And I'm excited to give the talk at the last day of the conference after witnessing the brilliant work of all the other participants. So uh, what I wanted to say is that I'm looking forward for further interaction with all of you. And my email address is given here. So. Uh, the biggest bulk of my talk will be dedicated in these two articles. Actually, I will only refer briefly to the article by, um, in collaboration with Chip and Liu, Andrew Childs, and various other friends. And I will proceed to a more recent work with Tong An. Uh, this work is supposed to be posted to the archive this coming week, if all goes well. So what I wanted to say about um, the, the first work is that I always like to emphasize this, that this is the product of uh, an in interdisciplinary and cross-sector collaboration involving three academic institutions, Maryland, um, Norway, University of Science and Technology, um, MIT, and certain company, Harry Crowe was in Raytheon, the BBN, now he is in a different company. Um, and Audrey Childs is uh, also a colleague at the University of Maryland. So Chip and you, Audrey Childs, um, me, we are the mathematicians in the, okay, Andrew Childs is literally a computer scientist. Uh, the remaining people, Harry Crowe, who is uh, working for industries, is also a mathematician. Uh, Lurel Nuno is an engineer. And, and uh, so you get the, the picture. This is um, an exciting uh, group, and we are very happy to have produced this result. So the biggest bulk of my talk will be dedicated to the work in collaboration with Tong An. Tong An joined the University of Maryland one and a half years ago, and he has been a force of nature. He has been collaborating, giving ideas. He has been mentoring PhD students. So I feel extremely lucky. And what we are going to, I'm going to refer here, I'm going to refer to some results on the construction of quantum algorithm for linear and nonlinear fractional reaction diffusion equation. Um, so I should say that high dimensional um, fractional reaction diffusion equation arise extensively in science, in various fields, in biology, in chemistry, in physics. Um, and exhibits re very rich phenomena. And what is the story? While classical algorithms for, um, let's say, uh, fractional reaction uh, diffusion equation um, take exponential, uh, require complexity exponential in the space of the dimension, this work provides um, this work provides a, a quantum algorithm. Uh, with complexity uh, polynomial um, in the space of the dimension, provided that you have a suitable access to a suitable input model. So we will see what we mean by that. So here is an overview of my talk. Again, the goal is the construction of efficient quantum algorithms for linear and nonlinear differential equation. I'm going to uh, refer a little bit to nonlinear dynamics and to the result in collaboration with Chip and Liu and the rest of the team. And then I will go directly to models of fractional refusion. Most of the talk will be dedicated to the linear setting. And here we are going to explore four different uh, approaches for the construction of the algorithm. Um, and uh, we, I'm going to refer to nonlinear uh, case briefly because it will have been discussed uh, earlier as well. So let's get started. The goal is the construction of efficient quantum algorithms for linear and nonlinear differential equation. And all of us, uh, we know, but by this we mean that our goal is preparing a quantum state 
encoding the solution at discrete grid points um, in amplitudes. So here, this slide presents um, a review of contributions on the construction of um, uh, quantum algorithms for uh, various linear and nonlinear um, problems. And of course, the starting point, as everybody has mentioned, is the work uh, by Berry in 2014. Um, and he provided a quantum differential equation algorithm which transforms differential equations into a linear system um, of equations using multi-step discretization and then applied the so-called quantum linear uh, system algorithm. Um, it can be any algorithm. It can be the HHL type algorithm or the advances by Andrew Charles and collaborators. So there is a rich literature um, around this topic. Uh, right now, recently, we have various refined discretization by Berry and collaborators, Childs, Liu, Childs and other collaborators, Grovey in 2022, and um, Berry and Costa in 2022. Here, there are also advances in the context of the time march and strategy. Uh, we witness the, the brilliance of this work in the talk of D. Um, there is the approach based on Schrodingerization, um, co contribution of Chip and Liu and co collaborators. And there is work uh, regarding linear combination of unitary technique. This is a work of Dong An, Liu, and Lin. And uh, this is the work that I mentioned earlier on uh, a nonlinear dissipative uh, system. And we're going to discuss uh, the role of dissipation. The role of dissipation in nonlinear, in treating nonlinear uh, partial differential equations, a nonlinear problem, um, is very critical, I have to say. And I should mention that um, I, my PhD advisor, was an engineer. And he was a, the master of continuum mechanics and continuum physics. And that's why I always believe that physics should lead everything, it should lead our mathematics, it should lead the analysis, because only by employing good physics we will be able to do good analysis and good mathematics. And this was actually uh, what we realized with uh, Chip and Liu when we start discussing about nonlinear differential equations, that the role of dissipation was critical. It is really unrealistic for somebody to believe that you can do, not only unrealistic, but it is very difficult to believe that you can do something for the most general nonlinear differential equation. All right, so um, let's, uh, let's uh, continue. Um, so uh, one remark here is that the quantum algorithms pre presented above can achieve exponential speed up in the system size compared to classical algorithms. And of course, one has to have in mind that the output is not a solution that we expect in classical uh, PDEs like x equal that. It is uh, a quantum encoding of the solution uh, in the amplitudes. So I'm going to start give you the uh, nonlinear fractional diffusion equation that we decided to work on when um, uh, Dong uh, joined Maryland. So as a prototype, and of course I will skip this, go to discuss nonlinear dynamics in general, and then I will focus initially at the linear part of this equation, and at the end only I will go back to the nonlinear setting. So uh, the prototype, uh, that we're going to use is an equation of this form. And I'm going to tell you precisely later on in subsequent um, uh, slides what this object here. This object here is called fractional Laplacian. And it is genuinely fractional in the case where uh, alpha here is less than 2. When alpha is, um, is equal to 2, it is the Laplacian itself. So. Uh, so these sort of models apply, arise extensively in um, biology and physics. C, this function C here, is a potential function. And here we have chosen this type of nonlinearity for, for, uh, as a starting point. Um, so even though I, have, I will be talking uh, about nonlinear uh, dynamics initially, most of my, of my talk will be dedicated to linear, to the linear 
uh, fractional reaction diffusion equations. And we're going to see that by applying um, <coughs> appropriate techniques like the method of line uh, and in some sense first discretizing um, the space variables, we can rewrite this system into this form that seems much, much uh, simpler. And this quantity here, the B, is the so-called discretized functional Laplacian operator. You are going to see the form of this operator in a second. And C of t is uh, the potential matrix. So let me take a break from that. I just want you to know what to anticipate, OK, what to expect. Because I think this is a very exciting um, aspect of the work. And let's go to nonlinear dynamics. And you notice, I, I presented a slide with a list of, um, with a review of contributions to the construction of algorithms. The, the contribution that I didn't mention, and I saved it for a separate title uh, slide, is the work of Leighton and Osborne uh, in 2008. I think that we have to give a lot of cre credit to this guy. Sometimes we measure uh, something based on the success of the effort. This work was the first attempt to handle nonlinear dynamics. And what the idea of the method was, it was very simple. In some sense, they decided to use multiple copies of the solution in order to uh, represent polynomial nonlinearity. Let's say that you have a quadratic ODE. They said, let's use uh, two copies of the solution. So this, this um, um, work presented a quantum algorithm. And this quantum algorithm was a polynomial logarithm in the space, spatial dimension. But the problem was that it was only, it was exponential in time, the complexity. So which means that this, uh, for practical purposes, such an algorithm could only be used for a very, very short time interval. And this is a problematic. However, I believe that these guys uh, expressed several ideas in, those, in this paper that had a lot of, um, it, they proved to be very meaningful uh, later on. Because as you realize, what these guys um, realize is that, you know, you have to keep up all the copies. And this is not the way to, to continue. There is a, a very big overhead. And that gives the idea that if you linearize the problem, you may be able to obtain uh, better results. So let's see. So uh, the first result involves um, a nonlinear system. So here we consider the n-dimensional quadratic ODE problem. Uh, in this setting, you are going to see what we have. We have uh, du dt. It's equal to this quadratic form. Um, notice that here we have F2. You should think of F2 as a linear op operator acting on two copies of U. Uh, F1 is, yes, uh, actually, it, it will turn out to be a diagonalizable uh, matrix, time-independent matrix, uh, acting on U. And F0, it is uh, the inhomogeneity. So this is our problem. And we have, of course, a certain initial data that it is also provided. So let's discuss a little bit more the assumptions. Um, we assume, um, and actually now we know a lot of things that maybe some of these assumptions we can try to, to <laughs> remove. But the assumption is that F2, F1, F0 as, are S sparse. Um, in my view, uh, given the recent advances, uh, given the, uh, I think maybe some uh, of these assumptions can be potentially um, uh, relaxed. So F1 is a diagonalizable matrix. Um, and the eigenvalue lambda j is of F1 satisfy this uh, Condition. So when we are talking about dissipation, dissipation is expressed by requiring that the eigenvalues are negative. This is the form of dissipation here. When we write the system in, um, as a PDE, the dissipation can be expressed by having a Laplacian, okay, some sort of diffusion. In this setting, the dissipation is expressed 
uh, through this condition that the eigenvalues are negative. So what I wanted to tell you guys, in my view, uh, this work that we did is a work on PDEs, because what I, I would like to illustrate is that very many PDEs of interest, several PDEs of interest, can be expressed as a, a second order nonlinear um, ODEs of this form under appropriate discretization. And we're going to see an example, like the viscous Berger's equation, Navier-Stokes equation, can be expressed as a second order nonlinear uh, ODE. So in the analysis, in trying to construct um, an efficient quantum algorithm um, that produces uh, a quantum state encoding uh, the solution, um, we are going to rely on a certain parameter, R. So this parameter R is in the center of, of the analysis. And what this parameter R does, it's a measure of the, let me show you here, of the strength of the nonlinearity, F2, we can, we can consider it as a measure of the uh, strength of the nonlinearity, and the driving force relative to the dissipation. So the dissipation in this setting, it is given by the magnitude of the um, eigenvalue, which is closer to zero in this setting. So this is uh, our parameter, and we want to, so given uh, Oracle that pro provides the non-zero entries of Fj, and uh, preparing a quantum state proportion to the initial data, we define this R, and now the main result says the following. Uh, the first result provides uh, an efficient quantum algorithm. So um, it says that consider an, inst an instant of the quantum quadratic ODE pro problem as defined earlier. We assume that R is less than one. What does it mean? We want um, to have a nonlinear problem that um, uh, it is not too strongly nonlinear and not too strongly driven by the, the driving force, okay, relative to the dissipation. So we want something that it is, it allows uh, some dissipation. So this condition we are going to see later on that in practice we have results, numerical results, that indicate that we can have convergence and an efficient quantum algorithm for practical problems for large R. But as far as theory is concerned, that statement has been proved um, in the case where uh, R is less than one. So we have R that is less than one, and I consider here this quantity that has been critical in many of the talks that we have seen so far. So this quantity um, says something about the way that the solution um, decays relatively to the initial data. It, so it is uh, the quotient of the magnitude of the initial data relative to the final um, uh, state, the solution of the final state. And we saw that um, even for linear PDEs, the presence of this Q is critical. So what does the theorem say? We saw that there exists a quantum algorithm produced a states that approximates the normalized version of the final state with error at most epsilon less than one, um, provided uh, and with, uh, quer with query, let's write it here, with query and gate complexity, but it is given in this, in this uh, relation. So notice what we have here, the complexity is linear with respect to the sparsity. The complexity is almost uh, quadratic, not exactly quadratic, because we have this log t here, uh, as far as the time evolution is concerned. It is linear with respect to q, which uh, measures the decay of the solution, and it is um, polylog in the space dimension. This is very critical, that's why we can uh, we're talking about exponential speed up, and it is poly long in the inverse of the error. So uh, the fact that it is very critical for this analysis um, to require that the solution does that if it decays, it decays slowly, let's say, to, to zero. We don't want 
we want to avoid um, exponential decay, and that's why we use this parameter Q to measure this aspect. So the idea and the math, we give the first convergence guarantee for the Karlman relinearizations for inhomogeneous, inhomogeneous quadratic PD ODEs. And let me say just a few words about this um, linearization. We're going to see this form even later on in the context of the fractional um, diffusion equation, but very briefly. So this uh, linearization method maps um, a system of n-dimensional nonlinear ODEs into an infinite dimensional system of linear ODEs. Of course, you realize we are applied mathematicians. There is no problem for us if we have an infinite dimensional uh, system of linear ODEs. What we can do, we can use truncation, and this is what we do to reduce the size. Um, and then we can uh, do, apply special uh, discretization in time and in space. And this is the approach that it is used. So what is the interesting feature of this uh, uh, quantum Garleman linearization? This is a very old technique that it is, many people would say that it was an old fashioned technique in fluid dynamics, actually. So, but what it says, you take, if you consider, let's consider here that U is a scalar and not a vector. So we have the first equation, this being this quadratic uh, ODE, du dt is equal a u squared plus b u plus c. Uh, at the next level, we say, let's check the, the dynamics of u tensor u. Let's say if we had, uh, in, if we were in high dimensions here, we are in scalar dimensions. So all we need to do is to check the dynamics of u squared. We apply the chain rule, du uh, is uh, d, d, uh, u squared. This is equal to u d u d t. Now we substitute d u d t here and we obtain this relation that consists only of three terms. It turns out that if you can do, do this um, for every power, you are going to receive something that resembles these uh, terms. You have at most three terms on the right hand side. And if you write this as a system, that gives you a system, uh, um, as a matrix, that gives you a matrix that it has a block uh, which is zero, zeros, and only three um, diagonals uh, are, um, let's say, uh, have non-zero terms. So um, very nice. So as I mentioned, after we have linearized, we use what we know best. We apply the forward Euler method in this work. Subsequently, other works like the work of Harry Korovich changed the type of discretization. Um, but here we use the forward Euler method and the quantum linear system algorithm um, in order to approximate the solution at the final state, but it's epsilon close to uh, the solution U. So this is the idea behind the Garleman linearization. Um, and that was what we used in order to construct the algorithm. The second important result of this work um, is as follows. The question is um, how important it is. What is going to happen if we have R that it is not less than one? So here, um, we have an example, that, uh, a theorem that says that if we allow r to be at least square root of 2, so you notice that there is a gap in this theorem. We have a result when r is less than 1, and we have a result when r is greater than square root of 2. So these two theorems do not cover the uh, region square root of 2 less than r less than 1. So what does this um, uh, theorem says is it really presents a worst case uh, uh, time complexity. It shows that there exists an instance of the quantum quadratic ODE problem such that any quantum algorithm for producing a quantum state approximating the normalized version of our final state with bounded error must have a worst case time complexity exponential in time. So if we assume, if we try, that means, to somehow construct an algorithm with bounded R, uh, then it will take exponential in time, 
effort in order to achieve something. So this is what the result says. And the ingredients are the so-called hardness of dis distingu uh, distinguishing uh, non-orthogonal quadum states. And, but what I, we actually did here, we constructed an example, an ODE. An, uh, an ODE. We considered uh, two vectors that are very, very close to each other. And then we con constructed a, an ODE example, um, and we applied this um, dynamical system on both sides of a qubit. And we check what is happening. And what is happening is that there is exponential um, quadratic, we designed quadratic ODEs that rapidly distinguish non-orthogonal states. So, and that um, means that the algorithm breaks down, really. So, uh, so here is something, and this is a food, um, a food, um, food, <laughs> food, food for thought, as we call it, and it is something that we can discuss with any of you who is interested. Even though we have this theorem, and the theorem is very specific, it says that we need to assume R less than 1 in order to have um, um, a, an efficient quantum algorithm. It turns out that if you consider an example, if you consider the viscous Berger's equation, so the viscous Berger's equation is a PD. That's why I'm saying that even though whatever I have written there appears as an ODE system, really this method gives results for PDs. Even in compressible fluid dynamics, we can have many, many applications. So if you consider the viscous Berger's equation with this initial data and with force that is given here, and if we do what I mentioned in my earlier on, if we discretize in time and space, so let's say we consider central difference scheme, so we replace this by this quantity, then, and here I have a quantity r, because I want to emphasize that the r that you see here is quantity qualitatively equivalent to the Reynolds number in fluid dynamics. So we saw here in fluid, in fluid dynamics, the Reynolds number is given as the ratio of internal forces divided by viscosity. So what did our numerical results show is that even when R is very large, even um, as large as 20, uh, we can obtain a very good convergence. And here, this you can illustrate this. We can illustrate this in this graph. In particular, you can see that the Carlman solution, with the Carlman solution at some uh, times, and how it uh, it is connected to the exact solution. So you see that it is really, really a very good approximation, even when the Reynolds number um, is uh, about 20. So what is the moral of the story? The moral of the story is that maybe we have to understand a little bit better the dissipative mechanism. Maybe we have to try to understand how diffusion um, uh, affects things um, and try to prove even better algorithms, better um, theorems. And now, is there any question here, actually? Let me pause for a second. OK. We will have the chance to discuss uh, Carleman linearization in a little bit. So uh, let's consider Wait, now. Gonna, sorry, it took me a while to think about my question. Was. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to understand the uh, the conclusion here. So is the, are on the plots? Um, Which plot? This. Yeah. So is this is this showing that like despite uh, you know you predicting that it would have exponential performance, like numerically, it actually um, has you, decent performance. You do that very good. This is classical simulations. Yeah. OK, this is classical. But this is what it shows. And is the Reynolds number, what's the relationship between that and this R parameter? It's equivalent. It is, they are equivalent, uh, qualitatively equivalent, as I call it here. Because if you see, it is the internal forces divided by the viscosity and our R the dissipation, it appears here, like the new. And here we have forces. So qualitatively, I don't say that it is exactly the same thing. But qualitatively, they are equivalent. And is the performance better because like, 
the particular instance that you chose it like works out well, or is it because the analysis is loose? <laughs> it is just an observation. This is not a proof. This is an observation. It's numerical work. Uh, but um, I don't say that, oh, you mean the anal our analysis, this, this analysis being loose. I think here I, I cannot see <laughs> a way to improve the argument that we are, go we, are, we are using here. So it is something that it is of interest. Sometimes physics leads you in a way to find new constructions of things. And I think this is why, what I'm alluding here. I'm alluding that maybe, just maybe, the fact that this is not a proof, it's just an experiment that we do with a certain initial data, gives us this convergence, indicates that there is room to do something better in that. And I, don't, I cannot say with what this something is, OK? Um, I should mention here that uh, there is a recent work by Tuhin uh, Sahati that uh, they are considering um, uh, nonlinear ODEs of polynomial type. Uh, and they have obtained certain interesting results. Okay, so let me now. So when I saw that uh, Dongan came, I told him, <laughs> I, I realized how strong Dongan is. I said, yeah, Dongan, we, we, have, we, should, we should try to do something with uh, fractional uh, reaction diffusion equation. I had noticed the work that he had done with Chin Peng, Lin Lin. And I, I know that mathematically there is enough work done and enough understanding about the fractional Laplacian as an operator. And that's why I suggested to consider a problem of this form. And the truth of the matter is that um, there are many models in biology here. We chose this because it has some nice uh, non-linearity, like the logistic type of reality, but we, you can do uh, various types of uh, non-linearity. This is just an example that I put here. So what is so important about, um, about the fractional Laplace? And one interesting point is that um, this uh, operator uh, in the bounded domain has various definitions. But here we decided to do uh, to work with a periodic domain, uh, and we chose the most uh, um, amicable, let's say, definition, uh, because in the in this setting uh, things are equivalent in some sense. So uh, the fractional Laplacian operator uses the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the original Laplacian. Uh, here we call lambda j uh, the eigenvalues of uh, the Laplace operator, and ej the corresponding eigenfunction. Um, in this setting, we define the fractional Lapla uh, Laplacian giving the spectral fraction, uh, fractional Laplacian definition, which is given as uh, a linear combination of these eigenvalues. Um, and this quantity here, which is nothing else than the L2 inner product on zero on the torus. So this is my definition of the fractional Laplacian. I simply express it in terms of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the Laplace uh, equation, of the Laplace operator. So this is the uh, eigenvalue, and this is the eigenvectors of the Laplacian. So let's see what we can say. Immediately, you can understand that there are two big challenges here. First of all, as in the case of the Laplace operator, the fractional uh, Laplacian uh, is, is an unbounded operator. So, so what does this mean? Um, so if you try to specially discretize it, it has a huge, a really huge spectral norm. And this can be problematic when you try to create efficient quantum algorithms. Um, <clears throat> the second important point, and this has been a difficulty in many of the talks that you uh, were presented here, is the fact that if you consider a fractional Laplacian, then you are dealing, after special discretization, with a, a system that, um, whose coefficient matrix um, is very dense. So we are dealing with uh, operators here, um, oh, sorry, with operators 
that are uh, dense operators. And I'm going to show you in a second what I mean, the operator that corresponds to the, the fractional Laplacian. So this is, the reason for that is because the fractional uh, differential operators are global operators. Um, and depends, in some sense, of the function evaluated in the entire uh, space. Um, and this poses a lot of difficulty. And of course, we all know, after the discussion that uh, we have been here, how we're going to deal with this. And this is something that Dong said immediately. He said, oh, we have to use the block encoding of the solution. I had no idea what the block encoding of the solution. After being in this conference, I realized that it is one of the most important <laughs> aspects in the quantum computing. But it was uh, Dong An who said, we can do that because we can apply block encoding. Yes. So your definition of the fractional Laplacian agrees with the uh, Fourier definition. Is that uh, equivalent? Which, uh, which? Uh, the, the, the definition of the, uh, the this, uh, fractional Laplacian is equivalent to the Fourier definition. Fourier, it is equivalent oh, okay. in this setting, yeah, yeah, but yeah. it is a torus. Okay. Yes, okay. Yes, yes. But later on, in, uh, in the case of the bounded domain, we have to choose what we oh, want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, yeah. this is something that we are discussing with Doug, and we may choose the rich uh, definition through the rich operator. Yes. So, uh, okay, so let's see the setup as we usually in this business. Uh, we let n be a positive integer, we discretize um, in space using equidistant nodes. And then, as usually, um, we know that quantum algorithms for solving this uh, equation aims at preparing a quantum state appropriately encoding the final state in its amplitude. So we have to do um, to approximate this quantity. Um, and I mentioned here that there are several different uh, definitions of uh, the fraction Laplacian, Laplacian on bounded domain, and I will show such a definition at the end of my talk. So using this property by applying the method of lines, first discretizing the space variable, we obtain a system of uh, ODEs. And uh, what is happening is that um, this B here, is the discretized functional Laplacian uh, operator. And this here is the potential matrix. So, OK, <laughs> as you all discuss, as we, as we have seen repeatedly in this, uh, in this conference, one of the most important ingredients is the block encoding uh, of the solution that, uh, in some sense, replaces uh, a given matrix that may not be uh, unitary by a larger matrix uh, by having this rescaled quantity on the upper left uh, part of the uh, of this matrix UA. And as Dong An said very nicely, you, one doesn't care about what you put in these three um, parts of the of the picture. So we are going to I uh, account, this is one of the main ingredients. So before I continue, I'm going to uh, focus a little bit on the uh, linear uh, special fractional uh, re reaction fusion equation. So here, this is my linear equations without the nonlinearity. And um, what we are going to do uh, I say that uh, throughout this discussion, we assume that this is non negative. This is without loss of generality because there are arguments uh, that show that if this is not the case, you can construct a sifting and then you can pr produce a model which is actually quantumly equivalent. So, this is not a big issue. So, what is the strategy? As before, I said, we're going to use the method of lines. And we first discretize the special variable to obtain a system of ODEs. And then we solve these ideas, ODEs, using different quantum algorithms. So and in this work, we consider four different quantum algorithms. So it is uh, the second order Trotter formula, the time marching method, the truncated Dyson series method, and a linear combination of Hamiltonia simulation in the interaction picture. So let's say a few words about each one of these. 
Ah, but before that, let me just show to you, this is a slide, but I don't even want you to look at it. Uh, this is a slide that says that you can approx appropriately discretize in, uh, in space using some grid points here. And then we can define operators B, D, and C so that we can express this uh, PD into this um, OD in some sense. And this quantity B is the discretized fractional Laplacian. So, so I just, I'm just going to say a few words about this four methods that we are using, very brief, because they, they have been discussed extensively. And then I will show you their performance. Um, we solve the differential equation by Trotter formula. As you remember, because it has been exp expressed during this uh, conference, the method involves uh, dividing um, the time interval into R equilength segment, specifying set um, step, and then you consider an approximation of this operator here that we are interested in uh, through this product, where S2 uh, is given by this product. So this, uh, this, uh, this is a way to approx appropriately approximate um, this operator using these functions of this form, which, as you see, it involves the products of exponential. Um, and as typically is the case, here we first derive a bound of the Trotter error, and so that the choice of the number of the segments, um, the choice of the number of segments for bounded error. So this is uh, 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 the standard thing that we are doing. How can one quantumly, let's say, implement this approach? Uh, as you have heard in many talks, the main idea is to construct the block encoding of these operators and multiply them together. And the block encoding can be constructed, I say here, using controlled rotations. I'm not really sure what in practical purposes what it means as far as from experimental point of view, but um, the, the block encoding, uh, in, in principle, can be constructed by using control uh, rotations, since each evolution operator is unitary equivalent to a diagonal matrix, and the corresponding unitary transformation matrix is efficiently implemented. So, uh, very good. So there is an additional point that one has to mention, that this operator, one of these two operators, still depends on the specific time. So one has to do more. It has to use the counter register in the compression uh, gadget at the time clock as well. So what it means, we have somehow to um, rewrite the problem into a form that we can handle. So what about the time marching method? The time marching method was illustrated very successfully with uh, D yesterday. It says that, um, and I'm going to tell you what are the uh, convergences that we have uh, in connection with this. Um, so the algorithm, and this is the algorithm that we are using, is the one proposed by uh, Fang, Lin, and Tong. Um, this algorithm is designed for general ODEs of this form with a time-dependent matrix uh, value, um, function A of t. And the method involves, as usually, um, you do appropriate discretization, divide the time into small um, time intervals, and apply a short time evolution operator sequentially. Um, the time matching method avoids, as D discussed the other day, huge overhead by combine, combining the uniform singular value transformation and the amplitude amplification. So this is one of the methods that we discuss, and we are going to see the performance. The third one is the Tyson, the truncated Tyson series method, um, introduced by Perry and collaborators. And this method is based on the truncation Dyson series. The method involves expanding the solution via truncated Dyson series and encoding into a linear system of equations, solving it 
using the optimal quantum linear system algorithm. Um, and it turns out that it works for the most general linear ODEs with time-dependent coefficient metrics and possibly in homogeneous terms. And the best, last but not least, because it turns out that for our purposes, the linear combination of Hamiltonian simul simulation is the best performer. Um, so the linear combination of Hamiltonian simulation in this setting, we uh, consider the fractional Schrodinger equation. Now we can write this in this form. Uh, then by defining the interaction picture Hamiltonian, the interaction picture Hamiltonian was um, presented by Tong Gan and other speakers this week. It involves the multiplication of certain operators. Um, we may obtain the transformed solution by simulating a Hamiltonian uh, system. So we reduce the problem to a Hamiltonian simulations problem. Um, so here in this setting, we can show that the HI of T is bounded independently of the spectral um, norm of B. And this is the reason that this performance of this method is better than the other two methods. In the other two methods, the complexity estimates uh, depend on the spectral um, norm of, um, of, the, of B. Whereas here, um, we are able to bound H, this operator independently of the spectral norm of B. Um, therefore, we may efficiently simu simulate the interaction picture Hamiltonian. Um, very nice. And we can show, as we are going to see in the performance, that the, um, if we have a linear dependence on H, the norm of HL, but only a polylogarithmic depends on its derivatives. Uh, OK. Yes. What is the physical interpretation of a fractional Schrodinger equation? Just to like some. So the fractional Laplacian equation appears in biological systems where the scales, uh, there are changes in biological moments that happens much rapidly um, as other processes. So biological processes, chemical processes, where the, there are uh, the changes happen uh, at a very rapid times and space, as far as space and time, this can be modeled only with the fractional uh, Laplacian. Yeah, so, sorry, I, I didn't mean to no. It's like uh, you have like a momentum operator type of thing that it's different. Can, can you repeat this? Like when you're having, like if you have the usual Schrodinger equation, you have your momentum mm. square kind of thing, right? So mm. you have like a different power somehow, like you have some other version of kinetic energy. Is that a good guess? If yes, you... yes, it is a very good guess. Um, so here in this uh, slide, you can see the different performances. Um, so, and what I mentioned is that, as I mentioned, the best performer is the linear combination of Hamiltonian simulations. You see that the, uh, the complexity estimate is poly log in the space dimension. Um, but we can see how this uh, method um, um, works in this context. And in some cases, we have an improved estimate of the complexity, uh, even for the time marching and other methods. So let me make only a few re remarks. Notice that here we have a function g. The function g, first of all, d is the special dimension. Epsilon is the uh, correlated error. Uh, but the important quantity that I, I wanted to mention is this function g that appears in this estimate, in this uh, complexity analysis. And this function g, again, says something about the way that um, the solution, let's say, decays or um, describes the decay of the specially discretized solution. So this is something to keep in mind. And a few more words on this um, uh, is that, uh, let me make some comments about each one of these methods. Um, in the throttle formula, we need to implement non-unitary operators, as we see, and we efficiently construct these operators via control rotations, as I mentioned, and this, the so-called compression um, gadget technique. 
In the time marching method, we apply the method as introduced by uh, Di Fang and Lin and Tong, uh, and analyze the complexity in this setting. It has low state preparation cost and polylogarithmic dependence on precision, uh, but has a, a worse scaling in the dimension D and the evolution time D. And let's go to the last two. The truncated Dyson series method is directly applied to fractional reaction diffusion equations, as in this paper by Berry and collaborators. It still depends polynomially on the dimension, but uh, to its uh, spectral, no uh, but due to its uh, spectral norm dependence, has higher state preparation cost, um, and um, that's why it is not preferable. So. Um, the best performance, as I mentioned, is the linear combination of Hamiltonian simulations in the interactive picture. Uh, to avoid the computational overhead brought by the discretized fractional Laplacian B, we implement each Hamiltonian simulation in the interaction picture. And this uh, implementation relies on the rotation of the Hamiltonian with respect to B. And that's why we get um, an algorithm that has polylogarithmic dependence on the dimension D, and that's, it is the most preferable, let's say, algorithm in the high dimensional case. So if we wanted to say, I don't have time, but for the nonlinear case, one has to uh, do appropriate space discretization, reduce the model through this space discretization in a, to a second order let's say ODE, and then we construct the matrices that are critical in, the, in applying the Karleman linearization that, as I mentioned, are diagonals, matrices of this nature, and we can obtain error estimates that allows us to uh, obtain the results that shows that we can have convergence even in this case. So uh, as conclusions, I would say that, um, what are the conclusions? That for linear equations, we implemented all these uh, methods. Uh, among all methods, the linear combination of Hamiltonian simulation achieves the best scaling in the special dimension, which is why we are, what we are interested in here. And this is the most suitable for high dimensional linear fractional reaction diffusion equations. For nonlinear equations, we generalize the quantum Karlman linearization algorithm to the case with block encoding, because in the earlier work with Chim Peng and Andrew Childs, we hadn't uh, used the block encoding input or oracle. Um, and the fact that uh, this is incorporated allows us to extend this algorithm to the cases where uh, the coefficient matrices are uh, dense. And that's all I had to say. <laughs>